Chroma has always been a very unique Warframe, using colors to enhance and alter its gameplay and has given us a first glance into the whole sentience theme within the Warframes, with the other being Excalibur Umbra. Chroma has had a wild ride over the years and has been a personal favorite of mine. Despite the changes over the numerous patches, I still hold Chroma to a high degree, even though the competition has gotten significantly fiercer. With that said, let's check out this elemental Dragonborn and see what Chroma's got to offer. So Chroma first launched on update 16. This update brought players a new strange quest which also gave us a sanctuary and a new Cephalon NPC, Cephalon Samaris. Upon completing the questline, players were rewarded with Chroma and all of his blueprints. However, Chroma was unique at the time, as his parts didn't cost regular materials, but also required the use of various Warframe parts. Since he was an elemental-based frame, his parts required a Frost Chassis, Ember Helmet, Saren Systems, and a Volt Helmet. Now, Chroma during this time was pretty solid. He was primarily a tank-based Warframe that had elemental-based powers, and depending on the energy color, his powers would have differing effects, mostly with Elemental Ward. His first ability was mostly bad. You were limited in mobility as you hunched over instead of being able to bullet jump like you do nowadays. And Spectral Scream also worked like it does now with the elements, so you'll breathe out the damage corresponding to your energy color. Now thankfully, Chroma's kit just gets better from here. Elemental Ward was a very potent team buffer, as you can provide your team with insane boosts. Your red energy gave Fire Ward, which gave Chroma and allies a fire aura that will damage enemies around them, but also gave a big increase to health, thus improving team survivability. Blue Energy gave Electric, which provides Chroma and allies an electrical aura that absorbs damage, then discharges them outwards in front of enemies. Electric Aura also enhances Chroma and ally shields, which also increase team survivability. Green Energy gave Toxin, which provides Chroma and allies huge stamina, because yes, Parkour 1.0 did have stamina, and a Toxin Aura, which damaged enemies that came too close. And finally, White Energy gave Ice, which provides Chroma and allies armor, and creates an ice shield around the team that reflects incoming damage back at enemies. It's sort of like Shatter Shield, but on a more budget level. All of these buffs were really good and gave Chroma huge versatility when it came to team play, as he can fill a lot of roles in when it came to team support, but more importantly, Chroma was also potent on solo play due to the various buffs, as there was a lot of playstyles that Chroma had to offer. And come Vex Armor, this improved Chroma and gave him synergy with his various aura wards. Vex Armor was a Chroma only buff, so it didn't apply to allies, but it offered huge damage negation and damage boosting to Chroma himself. When Vex Armor is active, taking damage to shields improves your armor, and damage to health increases damage output from your guns. You only need to deplete 400 shields and 100 health to gain the max bonuses, so Vigor was used as a replacement for redirection to instantly gain the armor boost. Now keep this ability in mind because on release, Vex Armor had stupendous amounts of damage, mostly due to the fact that it wasn't a regular damage increase. However, we'll get back to this in 2018. And finally, come Effigy, this allowed Chroma to shed his skin increasing his movement speed, but also providing strength to Chroma and the team within range. It does have a pretty hefty energy drain, and you'd have to sacrifice either power duration or power strength, which negatively affects your ward and vex armor. But the option to try Effigy was there in certain cases. Chroma on release was very good for both solo and team play, because he was a very tanky Warframe like Frost and Rhino, and as a result, he fared pretty good in high level content. And while he wasn't as crazy as Mag or Mesa, he definitely held his own. Also, fun fact, Chroma actually became Tactical Potato's favorite Warframe for several years. All of Chroma's builds were excellent, but the most preferred setup was using Electric Ward or Ice, since Electric offered good CC and shields, and Ice gave you a nice bullet reflector. But all of his builds were great. Toxin gave huge stamina boosts and amplified melee setups, but the Vex Armor itself did not affect melee damage, which was pretty awkward. However, with the introduction of Parkour 2.0 for the next update, people actually ran this less and less since stamina was getting removed. And Heat was also pretty decent, giving you huge health bonuses, which did work well with Vex Armor. And furthermore, Chroma on release had a great bug that let him build up Vex Armor a lot better, as with both Heat and Electric Wars, they would proc the Vex Armor boost if they ran out while Vex Armor was active. Unfortunately, it did get fixed shortly after, as the intended method of Chroma was to take damage from enemies, not using the shield and health depletion from the wards. However, keep this in mind, unintended behaviors and bug fixes. We will get back to this later. And finally, Chroma launched with a new raid, Law of Retribution. Now, Chroma wasn't a staple frame when it came to lore, but he did have some use with his Ice Ward on the pad phases. 
And come JV, he excelled more at that since he can face tank and that was a good trait to have when it came to Jordas. But what's important isn't Chroma's usage in raids, rather what the raids gave to Chroma. Law of Retribution introduced Arcanes to the game. These alternate variations of mods would be applied to cosmetics and give the Warframe new secondary effects. Two of these Arcanes were extremely important for Chroma that amped his tanking capabilities to the next level. The original Arcane Guardian and Arcane Grace. One hour survival missions on Ceres, one after another to see what kind of damage I could soak up and with the addition of Arcanes I could literally stand in front of a Grenier Heavy Gunner and allow him to empty his whole magazine into me while my health didn't move one bit. It dipped for a second and then the Arcane Grace kicked in and it leveled it right back off. The old Arcane Guardian functioned a lot differently. Instead of giving frames a flat boost to armor, it enhanced armor by 60%, which in turn gave higher base armor frames way more armor. Pairing this with either Heat or Ice, and alongside Arcane Grace, this gave Chroma a huge amount of tank and sustainability. However, if you also want to use Electric Ward, you certainly can, as Arcane Aegis and Arcane Barrier were fantastic for shield setups. Either or worked, and it was excellent for Chroma as he could tank really hard into very high level missions. But to think things ended there, you're wrong. Chroma got even better during update 17 as stamina was removed and we got the infamous bullet jumping. However, Toxin Ward would be useless, right? Well, Toxin Ward got a rework. It now provides holster and reload speed buffs when active. Is there also a coincidence that shotguns were reworked in this update? As a result of the new changes, Toxin Chroma became a menace with shotguns. The Sancti Tigris and Heck in particular, as the Toxin Ward would bypass their reload speeds. Pair this with Vex Armor and you got a pretty sweet setup going on. And overall, 2015 was an excellent year for Chroma as he remained a very good Warframe for solo play but also offered great variety of buffs for the team with his various elemental auras. And while he wasn't the first choice you'd have for raids, he still has some niche use with his wards and a max range setup. But more importantly, having Arcane Grace made Chroma pretty damn tanky. So post second dream, Chroma just got better, more weapons to play with, and Zenurin gave him a much needed boost to energy, and well, more weapons to play with. The new Nerimon Shadow Step was excellent and gave Chroma even more survivability as invisibility is invincibility. I mean, there's a reason Loki was S-Class for several years. Plus, this allowed Chroma to make better use of self-damage like concealed explosives to fully proc Vex Armor, since you were invisible and you can reproc Vex Armor easier without taking direct damage at higher level play. I mean, the option for self-damage was already there, but this time it was easier to reproc the buff since you're invisible. Now the real kicker comes Silver Grove 2, which introduced more Syndicate weapons. Melee weapons to be specific. Our classic faction vendors received some interesting additions like the Vaycor Sidon, which gave Radio Blinds, to the Sinoid Heliocre, which allowed you to scan enemies on melee kills. Some of these melees weren't too shabby, and considering we were in a melee meta with the infamous Memeing Strike and Old Prime Reach, most of them were pretty solid. But one in particular took things to a new level. The Secura Lecta. This melee single-handedly brought Chroma to the front of the meta. Secura Lecta on release had a wild 11.6 times credit multiplier upon killing enemies. And coincidentally, Akkad was a popular place to farm materials, relics, and XP, although it was competing with Birahenia at the time. Since Draco Ceres was updated to be a survival, the community was figuring out which places are best to farm affinity. Akkad was a dark sector defense on Ares. The map was quite small and it offered decent affinity. People started using the Secure Electa and min maxes credit potential. Note, this was before the index got revamped to the way it is now, so this was the best credit farm we had. Chroma played a huge significance in the team, as his effigy allowed him and allies within range to gain 2 times credit pickup. Pair this with a Necros, EV Trinity, and Speed Nova, all with a Maiming Strike on Lecta, and you were in for a very rich time. And sometimes you can even drop the Speed Nova and run a double Necros just to cover every single body. But rest assured, you were getting well over 1 million credits per run. But then the Secure Electa got nerfed. Well, that didn't last too long.
So come 2017, nothing really changed with Chroma. He remained as a very powerful tank in a damage boosting frame. And while Octava and Harrow both had their place and were incredible warframes, Chroma still remained as that one frame you'd pick up to solo high level content or just ignore enemy damage altogether. A very simple kit. Set and forget and destroy everything in your path. It helped that Chroma would deal even more damage thanks to stealth gas. Even though Chroma himself had no way of going invisible, simply launching a Zenistar disc with Fury up and hiding behind a wall did the trick. Yeah, I'm not joking, that was an actual strategy with Zenistar, since hiding behind a wall removed you from enemy's line of sight, which triggered stealth. And Gas did huge amounts of damage because of the initial stealth multiplier carrying over to the DOT. I'll link Distance video in the description as I'm not going into great detail explaining the calculations, as this video is more so about Chroma, and while Stealth Gas was an important meta for the game's history, it simply helped Chroma do more damage. Nothing out of the ordinary. But, what Chroma did do that was out of the ordinary, was starting to one-shot the Eidolon limbs. Update 22, The Plains of Eidolon. This update introduced us to the very first open world of Warframe, Cetus and its Plains of Eidolon. We got a bunch of new stuff to do. The game introduced players to fishing and mining, which became stable mechanics for the other open worlds to follow. We got a bunch of new lore, as well as a new focus rework and the introduction of amps, which are weapons for our operators, which to this day play a significant role in the general gameplay. And Chroma himself did get some new neat mods that did make his scorn buff easier to manage as both Augur's secrets and message boosted the duration and strength of Vex armor, and with its set bonus, it became easier to snag that max armor boost. But more importantly, we got our very first world boss, the Terrorist. The Terrorist was, at the time, the hardest boss fight in the entire game. It brought new mechanics and levels of complexity that wasn't seen before in a boss fight. The Terrorist had multiple phases that require shooting down its shields before it can do any real damage. And since we didn't have as much Operator Arcanes or new amps from Fortuna, this fight was genuinely a gear check for both new players and veterans. However, Chroma played a crucial role and became the center of attention for Eidolon hunting, as his Vex armor allowed him to tank the Terrorless attacks very easily and boosting his damage to extreme amounts. Once those shields were down, Chroma was one-shotting limbs like it was no tomorrow. And in a squad with Harrow and Mesa, Chroma was literally unstoppable. And even on solo play, Chroma had no issues taking out the Terrorless limbs. Lenka was the preferred primary to use, but Archiplasmar was also just as efficient as popping the limbs. But keep this in mind, these weapons had unique interactions with Vex armor. So after almost three years, Chroma gets nerfed. So this is going to be a bit of a doozy. So, Digital Extremes finally nerfed Chroma. After a few years of leaving him as is with little to no changes or fixes, they finally come in with the Shrines of Eidolon update, which introduced two new Eidolons, the Gauntalist and the Hydralist, which are supposed to be tougher versions of the Terrorist. And unfortunately, Chroma was raising a lot of attention in this activity, as he was adamantly one-shotting limbs thanks to Vex armor. But the reason why Vex armor was doing so much damage was because his damage bonus was not like the rest of the buffers in the game. DE quoted, Vex armor was a multiplicative damage boost that affects gun damage after mods. And while this is true, it's not the sole reason Vex armor was doing stupid amounts of damage. The main reason it was so powerful was because Vex armor actually double dipped its effects on weapons modded for an elemental combination like Blast, Corrosive, and Viral. However, weapons that already have an elemental combination by default like the Ogress, Archiplasma, or Lenka would make Vex armor triple dip its effects. Lenka has innate radiation, which is an elemental combination. So now you can see where this is going. The real problem was the bizarre double and triple dips with the power, not the multiplicative boost. But unfortunately, the boost is now additive because, quote, making the ability consistent with all other damage boosting abilities. Do you forget that Rhino exists? The last time I checked, Roar is not additive. It's not even close to being additive. But it also doesn't stop there. No, Scorn's armor bonus also got nerfed as a result of the new calculations. You know, if you wanted Chroma players to switch over to Rhino, you should have just said so, but okay, fine. But on the bright side, Spectral Scream got a buff. Oh, wow, so the damage is buffed by my current Fury Vex armor, and you have complete freedom of movement. So this is completely new. Right now, um, you can't do like crazy full speed movement. This looks sick, by the way. It does. Lots of love for my impersonation, so I think I, I, I gotta... Spoiler alert, it's still trash. 
So post Shrines of Eidolon, Chroma remained rather stagnant. His new changes didn't help him much, and while Vex Armor was now a full ward like Elemental Ward, it has abysmal range, which means a lot of setups would have short radius, since the best way to build Chroma was for high duration and high strength. You can, however, recast Vex Armor, which is nice, meaning you don't have to self-damage every time Vex Armor runs out. And this was a pretty good quality of life update, but it was overshadowed by its huge nerfs and... Spectral Scream buff. Other characters were starting to outclass Chroma in terms of damage. Volt, Mesa, Octavia, and Harrow all had buffers that increased damage and brought way more to the table, like support and CC. Plus, none of those frames had to shoot themselves repeatedly to get a buff. Chroma started to stick out like a sore thumb thanks to his awkward requirements for Scorn and Fury. But with that said, he was still a solid Warframe. And now that Vex Armor was a Team Aura, Chroma saw use on various level cap setups. Summit in particular took Nova to damage camp with her antimatter bomb, and pairing her with Vex Armor, Parasitic Link, and Flash Accelerant to boost the overall damage. It's nice that in nicer specific cases, Chroma at least brought something to the table, since Vex Armor is now an aura. And when it came to Eidolons, other frames did just as good of a job as Chroma did. But at the very least, Chroma was still used for Unaira Wisp. Despite the damage and armor nerf, he was still usable. Umbral Chroma is now a thing, and you can push your Vex Armor and general taking capabilities to the next level. With Umbral Vitality and Umbral Intensify, you can reach higher power strengths, and if you had space for it, Umbral Fiber in the mix. Chroma had become better. Still not as strong as pre-nerf Vex Armor, but better than last time, right? And come Chroma Prime, we got the Wicked Rubico Prime, which to this day is one of the best, if not the best sniper for Eidolon hunting, as well as the Monstrous Grand Prime, which became the best melee in the entire game at the time. Plus, with the Arbitrations update, we got Adaptation, which did allow Chroma to tank significantly better, albeit as a band-aid. So Fortuna rolled around. The game changed, but Chroma didn't. However, that's okay because shortly after Fortuna's initial launch, we received the new Profit Taker, a world boss for the unstable landscape of Valus. Profit Taker had some similarities to the Eidolons in that she was a big giant entity that we had to take down, and she also had multiple phases before being able to damage her directly. In order to take on Profit Taker, players had to acquire rank 5 within Solaris United in order to gain access to Vox Solaris. PT consists of a few phases. Upon reaching the site, you had to take down her shields, but in order to damage them, you must smash the damage type that was shown on screen. So if she had a corrosive icon, you can only damage her via corrosive damage. As a result of this mechanic, players had to mod for a wide variety of elemental combinations. And this is where Chroma comes into play. Before the entire subzoom system and Necromex, this boss was a pretty tough fight and Chroma was a perfect match. He could easily shrug off most of PT's attacks and gain his Vex Armor boost in a matter of seconds. And since the fight required Archons to destroy PT's legs after each shield phase, the Fury buff amplified the Imperator Vandal, so you had a very easy time during both leg phases. And when all is done, toss your effigy down and gain a sweet amount of credits. With a credit booster, you would get upwards of 500,000 credits per run as Chroma, which made this a very solid credit farm and one that would get highly optimized in the years to come by the Profit Taker speedrunning community. Okay, so come Railjack and Kuva Liches, which were both completely broken on launch, Chroma remained alright. And that's really because of his Vex Armor and Elemental Ward. I mean, give any other frame these two powers and they will do just as well, but I digress. Railjack was very, very broken on launch. It was absolutely hilarious. From the plethora of host migration issues to enemies simply bugging out or being able to slingshot yourself while loading. There were too many bugs on the release of Railjack. It was beautiful to say the least. But when it did work, Chroma was alright. Just being able to tank against the Veil Proxima enemies was a fine trait to have. And come Old Blood, which was also just as broken as Railjack with Kuba Liches bugging out in missions, more host migration problems, and of course my favorite, the Liches being able to steal my Requiem Relics. Sure, go right ahead. Go right ahead. But when the Liches did work, just like Railjack, Chroma was solid, tanking the Lich's attacks and dishing out good damage. Nothing really noteworthy outside of that, but he did appreciate the new Kuva weapons, as the Kuva Brahma was disgustingly OP pre Veilbreaker, and it did love the attention it got from Vex Armor.
As other frames continue to get more support and buffs over the various patches, Chroma remained stagnant. Good at the few things he excelled at, but paled in comparison to other frames like Volt, Octavia, Harrow, and so on, all who were outclassing Chroma in the buffs department. And it didn't help that Rhino had Roar, a better buff and one that worked instantly. Spectral Scream was still garbage and Effigy had no use outside of Profit Taker and the Lecta farms were long dead. If new players wanted to farm credits, they'd go to Index, which... Rhino also excelled at. And update 27.2 shows that. Not all Warframes can get it easy. While most characters got a buff with the new damage changes and shield gating, Chroma was left in the dust. Literally. With the removal of self-damage, this was a huge blow to Chroma's Vex Armor sustainability, because Vex Armor was, and still is, the only damage booster in the game that requires the user to take damage to gain a boost. Unlike Roar and Eclipse, which were buffs granted on cast, Vex Armor required the user to take a hit. For years, the best way Chroma users managed Vex Armor was with concealed explosives or glaives. This allowed you to deal the right amount of self-damage without face-tanking enemies, which was more unpredictable. With Primed Vigor, this allowed you to get the most buffs very quickly. But now that self damage is gone, you have to rely on enemies hitting you. But the higher level the enemy, the more damage you'll take. And now that shield getting is a mechanic for all Warframes, Chroma had a slight delay when it came to his Fury buffs. And Slash procs also do not go through shields anymore, which further delayed the Fury boost if shields were active. With rank 5 Arcanes and an update to Arcane Guardian, other frames became tankier. Baruch in particular outclassed Chroma in both DPS and tank as his passive and desert wind gave him huge DR without adaptation. Wukong was reborn with his 2.0 and obliterated the meta, and even Oberon had more merit and value with his buffs and renewal. This shows that Chroma was poorly designed from the very start. The concept and idea of a Warframe reversing damage is cool, but the execution was done terribly. Now Chroma's loadouts were even more restricted, as there were a few sources of self-damage left in the game, the main being Hema and Sigma and Octanus. There were reports of the Stug, if I recall, but I can't seem to find a source on that, so if you do know the Stug dealing self-damage post 27.2, then do let us know in the comments down below. But unfortunately, the Octanus got fixed as well, so now we're left with the Hema. But that too was on the chopping block. Thankfully, Chroma did see some use on Scarlet Spear's ground operation with a decent radius for at least buffing the team during each ore fix. It was optional, but the choice was there, and it helped that once again, Vex Armor lets you tank, at the very least. Come Heart of Deimos, we got a Chroma rework. Well, sorta. We just had to do it ourselves. The Helmet System. Replace Spectral Scream for literally anything else. Unfortunately, you cannot stack two damage buffers, so if you want a more consistent and easier Vex armor, just put on Eclipse or Roar on Chroma. And come up the 29.5, Chroma actually got some changes. You can switch elements on the fly with Spectral Scream. This is a fantastic buff for Spectral Scream. If only we got it five years earlier. Such is life. 2021, Gloom, Galvanized Mons, Primary Arcanes, New Stuff, Power Creep, you know, the usual. Nothing changed with Chroma, and everything else just got better. 2022, New War brought Chroma nothing, and Angel's reworked focus, which made every other Warframe that much better. And post Veilbreaker, Chroma got kind of buffed, but at the same time kind of nerfed, because Chroma's Cold Elemental Ward would actually apply a huge damage multiplier to the bullets that were reflected into Zato's Whisper. The spheres no longer apply an extra boost to the bullets reflected. But on the flip side, Toxin Ward now adds a damage buff on Weapon Swap, which is genuinely nice for missions like Disruption, where you have to prime enemies then switch to your DPS weapon. The only problem is, Elemental Ward is a subsume. Chroma has been outclassed by a multitude of Warframes, mods, and items. He's had his moments over the past few years, but for the most part, Chroma remains pretty inactive for general gameplay. Only used a lot in the few cases he excels at, like Profit Taker for credits. Other Warframes can do what Chroma does, and does it infinitely better. Revenant can face tank anything while buffing himself with Nourish, Eclipse, or Zada's Whisper. Volt has insane critical damage boost and wide map control. And Mesa? Well, you know what she does. It's no surprise Chroma is left to the waste side. However, if you are interested in his Vex armor shenanigans, he can be a nice damage buff for Warframe. Pair him with combat discipline and any method of HP regeneration, and you got yourself an alright Warframe. Chroma's got two passives, but I'm not going to count Elemental Cycle since 
that's just Elemental Ward. Chroma has Dragon Flight, which lets him perform an extra jump or bullet jump while in the air. This is pretty useful and would make Exodia Contagion even more busted, but unfortunately, you cannot toss a second Contagion with a second jump. With that said, it's a great passive for extra mobility. Chroma's first power sucks. It's arguably the worst first power in the entire game. Chroma exiles an elemental blast in a cone radius, and depending on your energy color, the damage type can change. From red heat, white cold, blue electric, and green toxin. The damage is actually okay when it comes to lower level enemies, however, when it comes to mid game and high level content, the damage is just not that good. Even with Fury affecting his DPS, it's still pretty weak. The cool part though is that Spectral Scream will chain itself to nearby enemies, sort of like a Kuva Nukor, and you can cast all your other powers while this one's toggled on, so there is that, I guess. And Afterburn is also not that good. It's got very weak stats and poor scaling. However, you can swap elements with Spectral Scream by tapping the power key. This will also change the effect on your other powers. Elemental Ward is one of the two powers Chroma has. Elemental Ward allows Chroma to release an aura around him that can affect allies and depending on your energy color, the buffs can change and have differing effects. Toxin Ward allows you to gain a damage boost upon holstering, as well as a reload speed buff for guns. This element also releases fumes, which have a 50% chance to deal 5% of the enemy's max health as toxin damage with a 100% status chance. The toxin damage will also be applied to an enemy if it is not already affected by toxin proc. The effect can't stack either, but it will refresh every 7 seconds. However, you won't really notice this toxin effect since most builds have low range and high strength, so if anything does come that close, you're going to shoot them and they'll die. Ice Ward gives you a layer of frost armor, increasing your base armor. Incoming hitscan and non-hitscan projectiles will be redirected, however melee attacks are not affected. The reflected damage is increased by 300% and has a 25% status chance. Unfortunately, the reflected shots do not gain extra benefits if reflected into Zada's Whisper or Magnetize. And the armor bonus stacks additively with base armor modifiers. Electric Ward gives you extra base shields and converts incoming damage into Arc Discharges. An Arc Discharge inflicts 1000% incoming damage as electricity damage to a single target within radius with a 25% status chance. The discharges will inflict a minimum of 200 electric damage, and the shield bonus also stacks additively with base shield modifiers. And Heat gives you more health and dishes out heat damage per second within the ward's radius. The health bonus also stacks additively with base health modifiers. The most popular wards are Heat and Ice, since these let you tank and survive better. But Electricity isn't too bad either if you're running a full shield setup with Arcane Ages and Arcane Barrier. However, with the shield gating mechanic, it's not recommended to do this. And Toxin isn't bad if you want more direct weapon DPS. Unfortunately, the auras do not stack with each other, so if you have two elemental wards, only the first one will activate until you've left the radius. Now on the flip side, elemental ward does have everlasting ward, which is a genuinely good support augment for elemental ward. The few downsides though is that it's not an exos mod and the ability is a subzoom, so everyone can use it. Up next is Vex Armor, and it's the main reason Chroma hasn't fallen into obscurity yet. Vex Armor allows Chroma to enter a state of Primal Rage, which will let him buff his armor and gun damage. When taking hit to shields, Chroma's armor will enhance, and damage to health will enhance his weapon damage. However, the Fury bonus itself will affect Chroma's Spectral Scream and Effigy's base damage. In order to gain the maximum bonus, players must lose 400 shields and 100 health. Scorn and Fury are also additive multipliers that function like Steel Fiber or Serration. If these mods are present, all the modifiers are added together before any further calculations such as elemental damage mods, critical hit, or multi-shot mods. But there is two weapons that gain a unique trait while under Vex Armor. Vex Armor will double dip damage on both Glaives and Exodia Contagion projectiles, so if you want to dish out huge damage, these two weapons are your best choice. And lastly, this power is an aura just like Elemental Ward, but its base range is also just as bad since the best way to min-max the spell is by building high duration and high strength. Vex Armor also has Vexing Retaliation, which is completely trash. Its base range is horrendous and it also doesn't work with Combat Discipline, which is at the moment the only way to manage Vex Armor by yourself. This power can be better if you don't need to self-damage in order to gain the boost. However, because of that silly rule, you're restricted to just using combat discipline. It really, really sucks because Nourish, Zada's Whisper, Roar, Eclipse, and Shock Trooper are all damage buffers that don't require a stupid gimmick. However, it's good, I'll give it that. Over a 1000% damage boost is no joke. It's just, the way to get it is really silly.
all right, I like it, thematically, but for the gameplay aspect, it's completely trash. However, there is one use for this outside of Profit Taker. So Effigy lets Chroma shed his skin and deploys his Effigy coat as a sentry-like turret. In this state, Chroma loses 50% armor, but gains a 20% movement speed bonus. Thematically, it makes perfect sense, but gameplay-wise is a horrible debuff. The damage of Effigy is once again based off your energy colors, or you can switch it via Spectral Stream's HUD. The sentry will also attack enemies within 20 meters with a stream of elemental energy, dealing up to 400 heat, electricity, toxin, or cold damage per tick, with a status chance proc at 5 ticks per second. Sometimes the sentry will unleash a radial blast if enemies come within 5 meters, which usually sends them flying outwards to the moon. But in recent patches, it's been resolved, thus making it more manageable if used. And the sentry can also roar, which will stun enemies within 30 meters. The damage per tick and knockback damage can also be boosted by Fury, which is where the niche use comes in. This power can do good amounts of damage when boosted and armor stripped, using Magus Lockdown and Voice Dance to group enemies together, then unleashing the sentry. If enemies are ragdoll first, the knockback won't push enemies away, and this allows the sentry to use its breath to DPS enemies down. Guided Effigy also enhances this setup to some extent, but the problem though is that the setup is very niche. It works, but also takes a bit of practice to get the hang of it. However, you're much better off just blasting enemies away with your guns. Now the main purpose is pretty obvious. Under Effigy, Chroma and allies gain 2 times credit pickup, which allows you to gain 500,000 credits on PT runs. And if the Effigy gets a kill on regular enemies, it has a 60% chance to give you more credits. And you can banish it, but if you're not using this ability, it's kind of worthless to do so anyways. But outside of the few specific cases, it's generally not a good power. And that's Chroma. Two good abilities, two very bad abilities, and four augments that are pretty useless. And a kit that honestly makes no sense. Chroma has come a long way, and while he isn't the worst of them all, he has a lot of issues that plague him to this day. With self-damage gone, the only reliable method of maintaining Vex armor is via combat discipline and a healing ability. Good for the few things he can do effectively, and has interesting uses with specific weapons. But outside of that, what Chroma can do, a dozen other frames can do just as good, and offer more to general gameplay. But sometimes maybe just setting and forgetting is a nice approach. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more in the future, then be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts about Chroma down below, and I will see you next time.